Great, if everybody wants to turn their cameras on. Great. So, yeah, um, let's just start. This is the session number two, um, part of the uh, socioeconomics of climate change theme, and it's called Differences Between Growing and Thriving Economies. Um, yeah, my name is Franca, and um, I'll be co-chairing the session together with Silas. And um, yeah, we have great guests, Nina and Bob and they're going to speak about their views on how economics is interconnected with the social and environmental issues of our times and yeah how also we can transform our dependency on this economic growth and profit paradigms and yeah so just to talk about just a bit of an intro into the theme of the session. Um, yeah, right now we're experiencing a range of climate change disasters such as those floods in Western Europe. But as we know, these um, disasters have been affecting communities in the global south and many places for a long time and they continue to get worse. Also how, um, yeah, Gayati Gosh said this morning in the opening session, not only are we already in the midst of the climate crisis, but it's operating on so many unpredicted ways. So, um, yeah, we're wondering, so in, in these times where people's livelihoods and whole ecosystems are at risk, we're all as rethinkers or as economics or students in all of this. And also, what do we need right now? Is it a radical rethinking of our taken for granted economic and societal structures? Or do we need a um, blueprint of a greener economy. So, yes, this is uh, what we're going to discuss today with our panelists, um, especially focusing on their ideas on the Green New Deal, on donut economics and on degrowth, um, addressing these issues and also how they seek to find solutions to these issues. So, um, yeah, we're going to start with a short input by each of the presenters. They're just going to talk about their ideas and uh, then we're going to ask some general questions to kick off the discussion. But for everyone attending, you can already, when you uh, start writing your questions in the Q&A tab, whenever yeah, something comes up. And then, um, yeah, we, the others can also read the questions and then vote which ones are they're most interested in so we can kind of see um, which ones are most pressing and also you have two you can ask either anonymously and then we'll just read out the question or if you ask if you put your name then we'll also give you the chance to ask the question yourself and you can put your video on and um, yeah let's start um, okay just... thanks thanks Franca I'll just introduce our first speaker today so our first speaker is Dr. Robert Pollan, a distinguished university professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's also the founder and president of PEAR, an Amherst-based green energy company, and has consulted with several organizations, including the US Green New Deal Network and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development on various aspects of building high employment green economies. And his most recent book, co-authored with Noam Chomsky, is Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. So today he will be sharing his vision for a global green new deal and how it would solve the climate crisis. Anyway. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for having me here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak at the conference and I wanna thank the organizers. Having organized a few conferences myself, I know it's very, very demanding, difficult work far more difficult than just showing up and being a speaker. So this is very important work and part of the organizing of addressing the climate crisis is to do the work to organize events like this. So my hat's off to them. So uh, I'm gonna start off by uh, just making some really basic points. Um, the starting point in my view for a global climate stabilization project begins with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
the goals that they set in their 2018 study uh, of how we have to proceed to hit a 1.5 degrees stabilization path. Um, they say in that 2018 study that we have to address uh, two basic uh, goals with respect to decarbonization. One is to reduce global CO2 emissions by 45% as of 2030, which by the way is eight and a half years from now, and then to be at uh, net zero emissions as of 2050. So um, I'm gonna take those as the basic starting point. Now I'm aware that there is a, in circulation, a new IPCC study that is not coming out until next February. And uh, according to news reports, I guess from leaked ver versions of preliminary drafts, that the assessment that is going to come out in 2022, February, is going to be more dire than even the very dire report that came out in 2018. Nevertheless, I'm going to focus on the 2018. That's the information that we have in front of us. In order to hit the uh, IPCC targets, uh, I think that the idea of a global Green New Deal is the way forward. It's a viable project. It's a project that can advance uh, climate stabilization in an egalitarian way. That is, it is specifically, this is what I understand the Global Green New Deal to be. Other people can have other definitions, but according to me, it is a means through which we can hit exactly the IPCC targets set out in 2018, and to accomplish this in ways that expand decent job opportunities throughout the world, and raises mass living standards for working people in the poor throughout the world. That's it, that's the project, it's that straightforward. Now, how do we accomplish those goals? Well, if we're talking about cutting CO2 emissions as the centerpiece of the project, we have to understand the sources of CO2 emissions. 70 to 75% of emissions come from burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy, fossil fuels. Uh, the other uh, major source, the other 25 to 30 percent, results from agricultural and forestry practices, or I could say malpractices. Uh, therefore, the core project of any climate stabilization uh, must be to transform these two global industries. That is the energy industry, first and foremost. We have to transform it away from fossil fuel dominance to a high efficiency energy system uh, whose uh, basic source of energy is clean, renewable energy. And secondly, with respect to the uh, agricultural and forestry uh, industries, we have to stop deforestation. We have to plan afforestation. We have to phase out corporate industrial agriculture and replace it with organic rege regenerative agriculture. That's the project. That's what I take to be the core of the Green New Deal. These policies have to be enacted globally, not just in the advanced economies, they have to be enacted globally. Why? Again, it's straightforward. If we look at the sources of CO2 emissions as of the most recent data, uh, China is responsible for about 30% of all emissions, the US is responsible for about 15, and the EU is responsible for about 9%. Add those three, those are the three big ones. But if you add them up, that's 54% of all global emissions as of the present, which means that we still have 46% to go, and we're supposed to get to net zero. So if we think about just adjusting uh, emissions coming from those three big sources, we'll never hit the emission reduction targets. In other words, if we think about India, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, South Africa growing, on the basis of a fossil fuel dom dominant energy system and a corporate agricultural system, we will never hit the emission reduction targets. Okay, I wanna get very specific as to what I think it will take to hit those emission reduction targets in my brief time, focusing on financing, okay? Uh, a model that I myself developed uh, estimates that to introduce a clean energy system on, uh, and phase out our fossil fuel-based energy system, 
is going to require something in the range of two and a half percent of global GDP every year uh, until 2050 to get to zero. Uh, that is on average about 4.5 trillion dollars uh, per year through 2050. That's my own model. Now, interestingly, uh, uh, other models have come out in the past several months, uh, which come to almost exactly the same conclusion. The International Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, came out with a model about three months ago. Their results were uh, literally almost exactly identical to mine. The International Energy Agency came out with a model almost exactly the same, slightly uh, off, but the uh, ARENA model, as I said, was almost exactly the same. Uh, another one, the um, Zero Carbon Action Plan, which is part of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals project, came out with a study for the United States, which again, almost exactly the same. So uh, we could all be completely wrong. We could be. I don't think we are. I think that's a reasonably good approximation of the financing requirement in order to transform the energy and agricultural systems. Now, how do we come up with that four and a half trillion dollars per year? Um, I suggest uh, in various publications, including this small book with uh, Noam Chomsky that um, Silas was nice enough to mention, uh, we talk about four basic sources of, fin of public financing. And the, the critical feature of these is that they are egalitarian. So we have a carbon tax, yes, a carbon tax, but with rebates, global rebates, so that we don't run into the kind of ex uh, experience we had in France with the Yellow Vest movement, where we, we propose a carbon tax uh, without rebates, so it becomes very regressive. Secondly, we talk about transferring funds out of military budgets. Third, we talk about green bond financing by the US Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. Uh, and fourth, we talk about eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. Now, a lot of the fossil fuel subsidies, of course, are effectively egalitarian in their own way in that it's delivering uh, affordable energy to people that otherwise couldn't afford it. So you can't just eliminate the fossil fuel subsidies. You have to transform them into clean energy subsidies or something equivalent. So in, in the model that I developed, that accounts for about 50% 50, 50 of the four and a half trillion that we need every year. And the other 50% would come from the uh, private sector, incentivized by public investment, incentivized by regulations and by subsidies. So that would be the basis on which we can finance this two and a half percent roughly of GDP every year. And I want to emphasize that virtually all of the funding would come from the advanced economy. So in other words, if we're doing green bond financing for the Federal Reserve, that they're not just buying green bonds to develop a clean energy project for the United States, they're doing it globally. So the countries that are responsible for having generated the climate crisis in the first place, starting with my own country, the US, would be primarily responsible for financing the trans, trans, green transition globally, not just uh, in, in our own countries. And we can talk about the details of that as you wish. The other big feature, critical feature of the uh, Green New Deal, as I understand it, is a transition for workers and communities that are dependent on the fossil fuel industry now. Uh, this is an absolutely critical feature of the framework because there will be people who are going to lose their jobs as a result of the, uh, uh, the contraction and the phasing out of the clean energy industry. So we have to transition the workers and communities into other activities. Now, this becomes relatively easy uh, because we also are building up an entirely new energy system. So there's going to be uh, very large scale job creation taking place as, as a result of these investments. I mean, it, there are various models out there and estimates. I've done a lot of estimates for many countries. Uh, including a lot of developing countries, including India, South Africa, Indonesia, uh, so forth. Um, roughly speaking, I'm thinking about uh, job creation in the range of 150 million jobs per year. 
to develop this project over time. So there will be jobs and we can transition workers who are currently in the fossil fuel sector into clean energy, but not only that. Okay, I'm going to mainly stop there, but the uh, organizers asked me to, or asked all of us panelists to address the issues around degrowth and around capitalism. So I'll just to be provocative, I will mention a couple things and we can continue later in the discussion as people wish. On degrowth, uh, I've written a lot about it. Some of you may have read some. I, I generally support almost all of the main aims and certainly the spirit of degrowth. My main critique of degrowth is that it lacks specificity. So when we're talking about a global Green New Deal, we are talking about transforming an entire global energy system. We're talking about transforming an entire agricultural system. The, the clean energy system, the regenerative agricultural system have to grow massively. That's growth. That is growth. You can measure it by GDP as you wish or not. It's still growth. So the energy system, the clean energy system has to grow massively while the fast fossil fuel system contracts to zero, or if you want to say degrow. So uh, I think it's, it's more helpful when we talk about this green transformation and climate stabilization that we be more specific. We can get into details on that as you wish. Secondly, and finally, is a Green New Deal possible within capitalism? Well, it better be, because we're not going to overturn capitalism in eight years. Not happening. So, uh, yes, the Green New Deal is, in my view, entirely possible within capitalism. It will take a massive political mobilization. There is a lot of mobilization already taking place. Uh, reasonably successful so far, but there's a lot to be done. I can cite a couple of examples here in my own country. The Sunrise Movement, led by uh, students, starting at my own university, actually, University of Massachusetts, has been extremely successful in mobilizing mainstream politicians, uh, such that we now have a, a, a program introduced in Congress called the Thrive Agenda, which is basically the Green New Deal agenda, uh, which came out of student movement. The second thing I'll mention, and finally, is the labor movement. You may be surprised to hear that. I myself have done a lot of work with different labor groups around introducing Green New Deal, most recently in California. You can read our Green New Deal study for California that came out a month ago that was endorsed by 19 unions in California, which, by the way, California, if it were a country, would be the biggest, fifth biggest economy in the world. The, our Green New Deal study for California was endorsed 19 unions, including the oil refinery workers union. So I think this is a tremendous step forward in integrating uh, environmentalists, labor people around a viable Green New Deal project that can happen right now. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for this input on the Green New Deal. And yeah, discussions already going on in the chat and you're yeah, already talking about it as well. But I think it's good to hear um, Kate and Nina's opinion on this as well. So I'm going to introduce Kate. Um, so Dr. Freeworth is an economist focused on making economics fit for the 21st century. Her book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century e Economist, is an international bestseller that has been translated into 20 languages. And she's a co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab, working with cities, business communities, governments, and educators to turn, to turn donut economics from a radical idea into transformative action. She also teaches at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute, and she's a professor of practice at um, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. So yeah, Kate, you can go ahead. Thank you. And uh, let me just say, I'm delighted to be here as part of a Rethinking Economics conference, because I think Rethinking Economics is an incredibly important and impressive international movement. And kudos to you all for sustaining and building and deepening the conversations and the debates that you host. You are hosting 
discussion here that should be happening in every economics lecture hall, but it's not. These are the topics that should be debated and you're bringing it in. So kudos for that. And I want to echo Bob's words. It takes an awful lot more to organize a conference than to speak at one. So thank you for the work that you do. This is all big team work and we all play roles within it. So to the conversation, uh, we're talking about economies, about growth versus thriving. And I want to start off by noticing that both of those words are words of life. Growth is something of living systems. Thriving is something that living systems do. And so I want to ask, what is the shape of health? What is the shape of health and what we think health and progress is? And so I'm going to talk, I really enjoyed Bob's um, presentation and talking about the nuts and bolts of policy and, and the, the transition that needs to be made. And I'm going to go to a different part of this debate and I'm going to go into the mindsets and the deep dynamics and the deep patterns that we think make a thriving and healthy economy. So we know we've inherited an economic mindset, any of us, all of us probably, who have had a 20th century economics education, which begins off with a very deep tacit presumption that a healthy economy is one that grows, and not only one that grows, but one that grows endlessly. So it's represented by this shape, the shape of the exponential growth curve. It's never actually drawn in any economics textbook, but it doesn't need to be because it underpins every macroeconomics conversation, every political debate, that the idea is that economy that is growing endlessly is a healthy economy and economy is not growing endlessly is in trouble and needs to get back to this situation. So I believe this is a profound problem and I want to move away from the idea of endless growth towards thriving, which is a very different proposition. So here is the donut. Um, and I drew it actually as, as one, my way of being a renegade against the mainstream economics I was taught to draw, to start economics, not with a tacit diagram that's never drawn of endless growth, but of a very active diagram that's explicitly placed at the beginning on the first page in the first lecture and saying, this is the proposition of what we're aiming to achieve. If we don't know what our economies are aiming for, we have no idea what economic success looks like. So this is one proposition, it's not the only one, but once we have it on the table, we can at least debate it. So the goal of the donut is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. The aim here, if we think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center, then leave nobody in the hole in the middle of the donut, falling short on the essentials of life. Leave no one below this social foundation, but also do not overshoot this ecological ceiling where we put so much pressure on Earth's life supporting systems that we break down the life support systems of the only known living planet in the universe. So we need to thrive. Thrive in this zone between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. If I do it with both of my hands, it looks like this. And immediately it feels like a heartbeat. And it's like a living system that's pulsating. And that's what living systems do. They thrive in dynamic balance. And that is health. So if that's the goal, we are very, very far from that right now. All of the red in this picture shows you the extent to which people are falling short on the essentials of life, the vast majority of them in low income countries. But we know there is deprivation in the midst of plenty in every country. And we are overshooting planetary boundaries. The majority of this coming from the world's richest with uh, a long uh, historical responsibility from the highest income countries. So this is the 21st century challenge. To me, this is the challenge we need to solve. And it's our generation's challenge to come up with economics that is fit for turning the story around. We have to remember that last century's economic theorists, last century's government policymakers, last century's business leaders, last century's community leaders did not see this picture. They did not face this challenge or they did not know it. So it would be crazy to think that their theories and policies and business models and actions would in any way solve for it because they weren't designed for that. We need to come up with economic approaches of our own that actually solve for the problems of our times. And it's very likely they will look like no policies and theories and business models we've seen before because they need to do something that those have never done in the past. So here's the conundrum. And let me move to growth. Right. So what is growth? Growth is an increase in GDP. I'm just going to define it as that to, to make sure this conversation is really clear. And GDP is the financial value of goods and services sold in an economy in a year. So growth is the financial value rising of goods and services sold in an economy in a year. Here's the conundrum. No country in the world has significantly reduced or ended human deprivation without economic growth. And no country in the world has ended ecological degradation with economic growth. And that's why there's no country in the world that's living in the donut right now. In fact, as countries uh, 
move along in terms of reducing people's uh, deprivations. We see their economies growing and you see the red in the middle begin to shrink. But as it shrinks, the overshoot begins to increase. So we have not figured out this double whammy, this double conundrum. And, and that's why I want to recognize it as a conundrum. And it's not easy on either side of the debate. Now, I want to move to the dynamics that I believe we do want to focus on, that we should put at the center of our vision in the 21st century. Two major dynamics. We need to move from linear degenerative economies, the take, make, use, lose of the linear throwaway industrial economy we've inherited, turn it into a circular, cyclical, regenerative economy where resources are not used up, they're used again and again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively and slowly. So from degenerative to regenerative, these are the dynamics of our times. This is what we're responsible for making happen. This is what we should be measuring in our economies month to month to month. And we have inherited divisive economies that drive value and opportunity into the hands of a few. The number of billionaires in the world has doubled in the last decade from 1000 billionaires to 2000 billionaires. We see inequalities rising in many countries. We need to move from divisive economies that centralize value and opportunity to distributive economies that share it far more equitably with everybody who co-creates it. And we know that that ultimately is the whole of society. So we need to think about the deep design of ownership, who owns the land and housing, who owns the enterprises, who owns the public utilities or have they been privatized, who owns the power to create money, who owns the data? Because if we can make these owned in ways that create public luxury and distributive design, then the sources of wealth creation return wealth to all rather than to the few. So these are the two deep design dynamics we need to create from degenerative to regenerative, from divisive to distributive. I'm going to come back to growth because it's deep within us. You know, if you tell anybody, I believe we need to move away from growth. And I think the degrowth conversation gets misunderstood as being around this as well. And we need to move away from growth. Anybody in the street will say, really? But no, but come on, growth, growth is a good thing. And growth is a good thing. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life. I have twins. I've watched my children grow for the last 12 years and it's beautiful. We have gardens and plants and nature and we love it because it grows. So growth is life, but it's just a phase of life. Growth is a phase and anything that's living moves beyond that phase. So this is the growth curve and this is what economists have put at the heart of our economic systems. But this is life's growth curve. It's the S curve. It's not exponential. Things grow and then they grow up. And that's what allows them to mature and that's what allows them to thrive and survive and last. Nothing that tries to grow forever survives because it destroys itself or the living systems on which it depends. And in our own bodies, we know that so well, we call it cancer. So we have to recognize that growth is a wonderful phase. And I believe there are many countries in the world that desperately need a growing economy. That is how they are going to meet people's essential needs. But we need to create economies now that have infrastructures and dynamics like none ever before, so that they are not endlessly dependent upon growth. So I'm not talking, let me come back here. Let's imagine the world's economies on this curve now. So I'm going to use my nose as the third hand. Let's imagine Malawi, Bangladesh, and some of the world's lowest income countries down here. I want to see their economies grow and to see it invested in health and education and housing and transport and meeting everybody's rights. They can't do it without a growth in income, in activity of the market and the state and the household and the commons. It will show up as GDP growth. And so, so let's have it. Now, there's a lot of countries in the middle that still haven't met everybody's needs and are already overshooting planetary boundaries. And they have to face up to the conundrum. But I'm going to go right up here to one of the countries that I'm sitting in, in the UK. And there's many people on this call from all over the world, but there's many people from one of these high income countries. Let's talk to Norway and Australia and Canada and the US and the whole of Europe and Japan. These are the high income countries that have more income per person available than any nation ever in the history of humanity has had before them. They have all the resources needed to meet everybody's needs and they're still not doing it. So one, just get that done. But two, we are massively overshooting planetary boundaries. And to me, it is here where the question of the possibility of endless growth is very, very real. 
But the reason we, one of the reasons we are so hooked into it, and this conversation is not even being had in macroeconomics courses. It's not even being had in, uh, in the media conversation, let alone in the newspapers, let alone in parliaments. Car Caroline Lucas is the only MP in the UK who I know who actually stands up and questions this in parliament. Why? Because we have in institutions that are structurally addicted and dependent upon this Peter Pan of a growth curve, this idea that growth will be endless, no matter how rich and destructive we already are. And we are addicted to growth in three ways, financially, politically, and socially. Let me name them quickly. Financially, we're addicted to growth because at the heart of the system we've created is a financial system that is driven to create a return on capital. It pursues return endlessly. There is never an enough and it never stop. And that means we have publicly traded companies that if you talk to the chief financial officer, they'll say, look, we would love to become sustainable. We'd love to pay a living wage. But every quarter we have to show to our shareholders that we have growing sales, growing market share and growing profit, the holy trinity of growth for returns to investors. There is no room for transforming. So our financial system locks publicly traded companies into growth and extraction. Two, we have political lock in to growth. No politician wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if your country stops growing and the rest keep on going, you will be booted out by the next emerging powerhouse. So this isn't just an economic problem. This is a, a geopolitical problem of international relations. How do we have a, a, a context of international relations that does not depend upon having the biggest GDP and I'm growing to keep up with you to keep up with you. And we're all growing to keep our place at the big boys table. How do we overcome that? We also have a lock in politically because until now, because of the way our economies are structured, if, if growth slows down and productivity within industry continues, you get a long line of unemployment. And that is what every government rightly wants to avoid. So we need to rethink work and the distribution of work. And lastly, tax. Governments don't like raising taxes, but if GDP is growing and then the same tax rate, you'll get a higher tax return. So it's a really easy way to get taxes, the tax rate arise without raising the tax rate. Lastly, we are socially addicted to endless growth. We've had over a century of consumerist propaganda launched by Edward Bernays. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He took his uncle's psychotherapy, he turned it into retail therapy, and he brilliantly figured out that if he connects every person's desire to belong, to be respected, to be admired, and to be loved with that phone and that that car and that jacket, he was onto something and he could continually sell the next model to us and that turned into PR and advertising and we are all being hooked in. So we're raised to believe that we've done well by our children if they live in a bigger house and have more cars than us and fly further on their holidays than us. But my 12 year old kids aren't begging for that. My 12 year old kids and many, many others are marching for stable climate and I can't buy them that. So. I believe at the heart of the 21st century economics education should be this question in every macroeconomics course. What if endless growth is not possible or desirable or feasible, or what if it's just not coming? Then how are we going to de hook our institutions from this structural dependency on growth? It's going to take more than economists to answer the question. And I don't know the answers, but I know that these are the questions. And if we don't start asking, we will never answer them. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kate. All right, so uh, yeah, we've had, uh, I'll just remind everyone, please uh, keep asking questions in the Q&A and after our last speaker, we'll get to your questions. Um, so our last speaker today is uh, Nina Trau. Nina is part of the degrowth and climate justice movement and active as coordinator, networker, and author. She's a co-founder of the Laboratory for New Economic Ideas in Leipzig, Germany, and has been working there since 2011. This year, she is also running for parliament for the German left. In her belief, the only way to achieve much needed social ecological transformation is by bringing different players, such as social movements, unions, and parties together. And today she'll be sharing her thoughts on degrowth and how it can address the climate crisis. Thanks, Silas, for the introduction. And I know we agreed beforehand that we won't see the others, but I would like to invite you to come up to the stage, like put on your cameras, the other speakers, because I think it's really weird to speak in the void. And I figured out you can make, the, I like everyone can enlarge their own camera pics. So Silas, Franca, Bob, Kate, please come on so I can see your faces while I'm talking. And um, I knew beforehand that I'll be going last. And I thought, wow, if Robert Pollan presents the GND and Kate, the dilemma of thriving and growing economies, there's not that much to add in. 
And so I thought maybe the most interesting point for the debate is that I try to react and try to throw in bits and pieces of my understanding of the GND in a thriving economies. So I'll try to go for that. I think one of the most important points that Kate showed and that I'm missing if you talk about the Green New Deal is that it's not only about the climate crisis, but it's about a, a, lo a many more economic and ecological crises around there and that we are talking about the social and the uh, democratic crisis behind it. So it's not only about um, making it possible for human civilization to survive in order to establish, I don't know, a green economy, but it's about uh, the world system we are living in. And this is very undemocratic, it's very unsocial, and I think Kate showed that very, pretty clearly um, that we haven't met all the needs of people um, but we are still already exceeding the plant boundaries. So I think every answer that we are trying to find um, to those problems needs to embrace all those aspects. And um, as Kate said, that's not something that many people in the world do, and we tend to focus on one. So you were talking about the economics, which is obvious, I think we, since we're here about we are thinking economics, but also like many of the unions worldwide, they address social problems and the ecological um, NGOs, they address ecological problems. And then economic institutes address the economics behind it, but it's hard to think it all together. So we have to do that. And um, when Naomi Klein wrote her book, this changes everything. She wanted to say exactly that. She wanted to say this question of climate change puts us at our very limits and it changes everything because Capitalism has been criticized for a long time and there's people organizing around it since it has started. But they haven't found a way really to get around it, right? Or we haven't found a way to really get around it or overcome it. And so the question now is, does the climate crisis catalyze the conflicts we have and lead us somewhere else? And one important point if you talk about degrowth and why we think degrowth is necessary is the rebound effect and um, the question of CO2 emissions in other branches of society, uh, sorry, the economy. So as Robert says, he agrees to the main ideas of degrowth, but it's too unspecific. And I do agree. I have the feeling that degrowth is still in the face of explaining itself and making the question visible and not that much in the face of having the detailed plans on how to move forward. And I am also for looking for those. But the problem is also that as Kate showed with her graph that we, are, we went this way, and now we have to shrink in many societies of the world in order to um, decrease our material and energy in, in throughput. And it's not possible to just stay on that level. So if we want to have a steady state economy where we are within the world boundaries or we thrive, as Kate put it, we have to degrow first. And yeah, as Robert said, we can have to grow in some parts of society and the economy, but the problem is many of the proposals put forward by the Green New Deal um, for renewable energies, for example, um, are around, uh, have to use fossil fuels anyways, right? If you put solar panels anywhere, or we produce um, new, um, new means of energy extraction with, with do, don't use a lot of fossil fuels on the, when they're used, they still need that in the production phase. Looking at German car industry, best example ever, people now think we can switch 48 million cars from fossil fuels to batteries. And those batteries are very, very energy intensive in their production. And then we want to run them with green energy, but we don't have enough green electricity in Germany. And we either, we either do decrease that, so we don't have as many cars anymore, or we import energy from somewhere else, and then some other countries will continue to use their fossil fuels. So the, the whole point behind is that, yes, we have to switch to renewable energies, but on a much lower scale. And that that is part of the degrowth deal. And then, as Kate also said, uh, many governments are very afraid of degrowth or about tackling the, the, the ecological crisis that we have, because they are afraid by facing out of 30 industries, we'll lose up many jobs. And that leads, that leads us to, to the organization of work in our societies in general. And that le leads us to patriarchy and to the question who has which jobs. And so 
If we want to have thriving economies where we take care of people's needs, we need much more care work to be done. Care work at home or um, in our, with our friends and families in a voluntary sense, but also professional care work in the health sector, in the education sector, um, in, with LS, etc. And so um, these kind, this, this is obviously if we pay the work and if we build, um, build hospitals, etc., then we have there is some growth behind it. But in general, this is not a growth sector, right? If you pay people, that's more like a study says okay in the end. So if we invest more in that, that would be also a very important example of the rebuilding of the economy. And I live in Leipzig, in Germany, in Saxony, where there's a lot of coal in infrastructure. And what you said earlier, that there is regions who are dependent on fossil fuels. Saxony is a very good example for that. And a lot of people, and especially Saxony, is also a region where the right wing is very strong. So people are really afraid of um, elder, well, not elder men, but men who have had their jobs for a while, um, who are industrialized, qualified workers, that they lose their jobs and we don't have anything to propose them on the industrial side. And then we, we lose out on democratic aspects even further because they have no good jobs. And most of them say, okay, now we invest in new energies and we just have, we keep this energy sector, but we have it now in renewables. And I think this is not taking our power system in and we don't think enough about the care sector and how labor is divided. And maybe a man and women in the families, if it's a man and woman based family, maybe they should all only, all of them only work 20 hours and then redistribute the care work between them. And then we address more questions of society. So. If we talk about that, we have to talk about the economy, but about the general um, organization of society as well. And the other thing is, um, which I think Silas introduced me with the last sentence, I, I believe in change by social movements. The question is, who is going to bring about that change? And as we all, I, we all agree, we have very little time left in order to curb the economies and our uh, current footprint. The question is, will um, governments themselves with very good plans that we develop, will they be able to bring about that change? And I would say no. I think we need a lot of pressures from social movement and movements, and we need a lot of um, players who innovate, who try to bring about new ideas for the new economy. And in that sense, we also gain more if we address larger questions. So if you also talk about racism and sexism behind it, and if you talk about the decolonial world, uh, a new decolonial world order that we need to establish because we have more players who win with that and it's not only giving the power to governments and i realize i have talked for quite a while now so i'll stop here and i'm looking forward to the discussion we'll have thank you okay thanks for that so yeah thanks to all our three speakers so far um so i think we've got so many audience questions that we'll just uh, get get straight into those um, so, Andre, would you like to come on stage and ask your question? You can also, if, I, if we don't hear from you after a few seconds, we'll just ask it for you. Okay, so Andre has asked. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, my question um, is, is for everyone, but perhaps um, uh, Rob can 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 dive into it. Um, my question was around renewable energy, and no doubt we do need more renewable energy. I'm not contesting that, but if we were to replace every single fossil fuel power generation that we have right now with renewable energy, we would need to produce a lot of solar panels, a lot of wind turbines, etc. How do we compensate for the generations for the generate for for the generation of the emissions for for the production of this renewable energy? Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, it was great listening to Nina and Kate, and thank you, Andre, for the question. Uh, so, um, first of all, I think that the first and foremost feature of a of a investment project, a green energy transition investment project, is actually not renewable energy. It's raising energy efficiency standards, um, and um, you know, modeling I've done, other people have done. I think it's fair to look at even existing technologies 
and say that we can um, raise efficiency standards to the point at which even within a growing economy, we can see uh, demand for energy going down. Now, by how much is a matter of debate. Uh, and that even takes account of, uh, Nina mentioned the so-called rebound effect, meaning that if you raise energy efficiency standards, people are going to consume more of the energy because it's cheaper. Like, okay, you can drive 100 miles uh, on, you know, one quarter of a tank of gas instead of a, uh, a full tank, but so uh, why not drive 400 miles? Well, yeah, people, we've done research on that. There is, There will be a rebound effect, but I, I don't think it, it, it anywhere comes close to contradicting the benefits we can get from having more efficient, highly, much more efficient buildings, transportation systems, uh, industrial processes. That said, of course, uh, building a renewable energy foundation is going to entail using resources. And as Nina mentioned, it's going to entail consuming energy. Uh, I disagree with Nina on the point where she said it will uh, be, there will be energy intensive activities. Um, energy intensive activities doesn't mean fossil fuel energy intensive activities. That is the transition process to green energy that you can produce solar panels on the basis of, on, on the basis of solar energy. I mean, this is a process that's going to occur over a decade or two, but that's, that's the possibility. So, uh, that's the reason that I think that we can uh, basically deliver something close to a 100% renewable energy global economy that will also be lower cost. I mean, if you look at some of the most recent data, uh, the cost of solar power and wind power, uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency put out a report a month ago that the costs of those are cheaper uh, that were cheaper this past year than 62% of all fossil fuel generation, the cheapest fossil fuel generation. Solar and wind on average are cheaper than the cheapest fossil fuel generation roughly 60% 60, 60 of the time. Now, this is not perfect. And there, of course, there, we will consume resources to build the, the clean energy system. But as Kate said, one of the things that is critical to making this work well is to enhance the recycling industry. In terms of the minerals that are used to build out solar energy, less than one half of 1% come from recycled materials. We can easily raise that dramatically. So that's the, that's the foundation in my view. Can I add a quick point in there as well? Just to add on to that, uh, thanks to the question, Andre. So just to pick up where, where Robert just was mentioning, I was talking about creating a circular economy, but part of circularity, okay, one part of it is recycling. Before we recycle, actually, it's much better to refurbish and repurpose and reuse and repair. But even better than that is to share. And I'm just gonna make it very, very personal. Um, in December last year, my partner and I just looked at each other and we said, we just can't justify owning a car anymore. There was a 12 year old diesel car sitting outside our house. We had twins, we were trying to get around, we got a car. I cannot justify using a car. It's super convenient, by the way. I have kids who want to play football and hockey and do it all. So convenient. It was great. And I can't justify it. And so we got rid of our car and we sent it off to be decommissioned and take it off the planet because actually it doesn't belong anywhere on the planet. And it was really hard between making the phone call, please come and take my car away. They said, we'll come in five days. And I thought, just could you come just now? This is really hard. Why am I doing this? Am I making a mistake? It's so when it had gone only when it had gone did i feel lifted and i live in east oxford i happen to live in a place where there are car clubs popping up and they exist because people use them so you can't only wait till it and i've joined a car club and i now rent a car when i need one and i love it and i feel so much more proud and sometimes I see it. There's, there's my car it's our car and we share the car one car maybe 50 people so it's also part about creating a sharing economy and that's a social technology that we need to bring into the mix too okay i'll, I'll just interject five seconds when i say invest in energy efficiency part of that a big part of that is public transportation yeah, I wanted to add something on the rebound effect. I'm, I'm not into having like very in-depth discussions about details on panels, but I think Robert and I just disagree mainly if the rebound effect is a very big problem or if it can be bypassed. So all the economic growth that we had is based on rebound effects and all that we had in ecological terms in the last year, decades is basically based on efficiency. So 
uh, that talked about the German discourse in the 70s and 80s, it was very much around energy and sufficiency. So do we po post more on um, efficiency gains that we have, or do we talk more about what we know, don't need? And it has been largely solved in this way, right? So we have a lot of individual transport, we have a lot more cars, we have bigger housing, um, we and all that, but we didn't talk about the way what we need. And the, the studies worldwide, to my knowledge, say that it's really, really hard to measure society-wide or even worldwide rebound effects. But obviously, there is a super good, huge rebound effect about all the infrastructure we have. And so I think we hope too much. We just think, oh, yeah, we can set on efficiency gains because they're always eaten up. And all the in, um, renewable energies that Germany has had for like have we have created since we put in the renewable energy laws is only having more energy and not taking down coal power plants, etc. And obviously we can now decide we change that, but that we have to change the paradigm we're talking about. And I thought maybe we can collect a couple of questions because otherwise we'll all we always answer only one and I don't know how many pass them. Great, yeah, I think we should try to move on because there's so many interesting questions here. So maybe you can try to keep your answers a bit shorter and yeah, by Andre. Um, yeah, the next one's by Anna. Do you want to come and ask the question yourself? <laughs> yeah, if not, I can also just read it out. It's quite a short one anyways. Um, so Anna asks, um, what does the financial system look like in a world without growth? Yeah, maybe Kate, do you want to start? So the question, Anna, you've gone to the heart of the matter because we've got a, uh, a conflict between two systems. There's a living system, a planet, this one, that is regenerative by design. Everything that is alive grows, matures, dies, breaks down back into the building blocks of life and comes back and grows again. And so things mature and die. And we've got a financial system. Oh, oh by the way, and that natural system was designed by 3.8 billion years of life on this planet. We've got a financial system that was designed by the Medici family hundreds, a few, only a few hundreds of years ago, and then totally a human design. Nothing natural, inherent, immutable, unchangeable about it. Just created. Uh, worked extremely well for some people. But it's a design that creates money as debt-bearing interest and has the expectation built into it in so, so many ways that it will accumulate returns endlessly. So you get a return that becomes your principle that gets a return and it get, and it follows the shape of the curve. And in, in Anna, the, the beautifully simple question that Anna's asked just goes to the heart of the matter. There is a clash between two systems and how do we overcome it? Because that finance system underpins business and enterprise and puts the expectation of endless growth into them or endless returns of profit. I don't know the answer. But I know that this is the question, and I think we need more and more people looking deeply at the design of finance. Can we use blockchain to completely break and rethink? Now, blockchain so often, because of the ways it's owned and finance itself, gets captured in this accumulation, like uh, um, Bitcoin. But that doesn't that doesn't have to be the future of blockchain. It can be it can design in so many different ways. And at the heart of everything is the question of how it's owned. And, and how is it purposed and, and to what purpose is it put? So anyone who's really got their head into finance, not only to understand the current system, don't get too much stuck in that because you'll find it very, very hard to pull back out and imagine there could be another one. We need really smart thinkers reimagining the possibilities of finance on a regenerative planet, finance that actually belongs on planet Earth. I'm going to stop there. Great. Maybe Nina or Robert, if you have some... Kate, can you put up your little signs with the five principles? So I really enjoy Kate's pedagogy. You, 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 they're on order now. You can order them. You wanted this one. Okay. So yes, we, we, need, we need a financial system. We need finance to be invented by, let's say, a bank, a bank of the people. What is the purpose of this finance? The purpose of the finance should be to finance life and health 
and to finance people's ability to meet their needs within the means of the planet. How does that finance relate to its suppliers and its customers and how is it distributed amongst people? How is it governed and who has voice and how it's designed and regulated? But crucially, how is it owned? And finance is owned ultimately by whoever has the power to create money. So who has the power to create that money and give it an attribute, whether it's interest bearing or demurrage, because that determines what that finance does. So across any organization, whether it's a business, an NGO, a university, or indeed a bank, we need to align these five design traits so that they bring about the dynamics of regenerative and distributive design. I also wants to add, but since I, since I asked for it, well, two, just two sentences on that. So if you go with what Kate just said, we cannot have multinationals anymore who are financed by a stock market because they are not oh they are not governed democratically they are not owned by the people who work in there they don't pursue um a goal which is like um, for the aim of good society and so if we take that down we don't need the financial market in that strong sense and we could probably close stock markets and also like the way the financial system now works is that Everything someone creates, which is not forbidden, can be done, right? And we should have a financial system where things have to be allowed in order to be pursued because there's so many things out there that even you, probably most of you study economics, that will, won't understand during their lifetime. So need a financial system that can be understood by the people who run it, and that's essentially just us and not only professionals. Sorry, Robert, go ahead. So I'll I just uh, bring things down a little more specifically. Uh, we have experienced a, a huge transformation of our financial system as a critical feature of what we call neoliberalism. A uh, critical feature of neoliberalism has been so-called financialization of the economy, meaning that the trading, asset trading, transformation, speculation around finance has become much more dominant than it had been. There was a phase uh, after World War II in which financial system was uh, fairly stable, highly regulated, and there was some priority put on channeling finance to productive activities. So uh, there's a lot to learn from that phase. Uh, that phase was eliminated under neoliberalism. And uh, we do have examples, in my opinion, of some pretty successful public finance uh, institutions, tools, development finance, that can be critical, that must be critical to generating the kind of investments that I described that will be central to a green transition. So uh, if we think about public development banks, uh, some of them have been bad, some of them have been good. Uh, if we think about incentivizing public development banks and uh, regulating the speculative features of stock markets. I mean, the, uh, 40 years ago, the, just to take one example, in the US stock market, um, there were, for every dollar of investment, there was $2 of trading. Now for every dollar of investment, there's about $200 of trading. So this is what has happened in the course of, say, my lifetime. We can reverse that through regulation and through putting a premium on investing where it has to go. I mean, the, the global financial market today is $350 trillion. So when I talked about the $4 trillion a year on average to finance a Green New Deal, that's peanuts. We, the, the issue is to mobilize it. The financing is there. We just have to change the institutions. Thanks for that. So to kind of jump off the talk about finance here, I do you have one question about um, how would a general basic income be part of this solution? And maybe we can also tie that into more generally, how would um, your ideas um, ensure an equitable um, solution to the climate crisis? You know, the past 50 years have seen a lot of growth going to a few people. How would we, how would green growth ensure that uh, that, that didn't happen? Or um, how would degrowth or growth agnosticism address that, the equity issue? start. Um, so many industrial countries, industrialized countries now provide a basic income by some social revenues that you can have. Normally, the big problem is that they're not unconditional and that the main idea is to bring people back in jobs where there are no jobs. 
Um, I don't think that the basic in, um, unconditional income is the best idea, but more a redistribution of work and a different understanding of what work is. Because most people want to do, they want to be do something, they want to be active, they want to be part of society. And I don't think that most people in society would like to just get money and then, I know, look for whatever it is. And uh, I'm sure Robert Powell will talk about that as well. In macroeconomic terms, it's also really hard because it's a question of just subsidizing jobs. So I think we need some social basic income, which is unconditional, that is great. Like we have to have it less sanctioned as we have the system for, for now. But I think it's more important to talk about the understanding of our activities and to redistribute work in order to just say, oh yeah, we'll just have the income, the basic income. I hope you got the point. Do you want to uh, just say really quickly, I agree with Nina and, and, and on your point on the centrality of expanding um, uh, elder care and all forms of care is as part of the Green New Deal. In fact, here in the US, uh, the Green New Deal Network um, has a program that I mentioned briefly, and it actually is called the Thrive Agenda. So maybe they picked the term up from Kate, but it's called the Thrive Agenda. And it includes uh, very substantial investments in elder care, child care, and home-based care, including, as Nina mentioned, that paid care by family members um, as, as a central feature. Now, that, that's, a, that's a really great program, and it'll change people's lives a lot. Um, and I would agree with Nina that having something like that is, is uh, extremely valuable, equally if not more valuable than thinking about basic income. But let's just say it's not going to do anything about reducing emissions. It, it'll do zero about reducing emissions. So uh, to me, it's really important to say, OK, we can't just focus on reducing emissions. We have to do these other things. Yes, 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 we do. Uh, but we must reduce emissions. We absolutely must reduce emissions. And it has to be, in my opinion, the absolute number one top priority because we're facing a climate emergency as we all see all over the globe right now. So we cannot say, yes, yeah, sure, sure, this is fine for reducing emissions, but now let's talk about other stuff. I say we have to keep focusing on emissions and then build a egalitarian program, an anti-neoliberal program within a framework that we get emissions to zero. Yeah, they're just that I think they have to go. To, uh, I don't think God would disagree. I think they have to go together. I think there are many communities. If you go to and say we're here to talk about reducing emissions, they'll say, "What are you talking about? My kids aren't in school. My house doesn't work. I, I fear for my child's life. It's polluted. I, I that's just so far from my agenda because my our, our essential needs aren't met. And so we, it, we do need to reduce emissions, and we need to ensure that distributive design at the same time. So that's why these things go together in the donut we need to reduce emissions but we need to reduce human deprivation at the same time and ensure that we have a far more equitable society one thing that i really like that's been recently launched in the uk is called the social guarantee so instead of saying let's have a universal basic income it says hang on let's bring a package of things together that are very feasible a living wage plus a guaranteed basic income for those who are not in work, plus universal basic services, by which we mean health and education. Let's not let those get lost in the fight for a, a universal basic income. And so oh, we just lost what really matters, which is health and education and care, as Robert and, and Tina and Nina were saying, care and housing and transport. So let's extend what is understood as, as a set of public services that covers for all. And I think I really recommend people go and look at the website of the Social Guarantee. I think it's a very good example. It's very UK centric, but people could take that example, say, what would this look like in my country? What would it look like to launch an initiative like this in my country? And when you have that kind of social package, it then means you can go into communities and have conversations about, and as we do this, we provide decent housing and, and transport uh, for all in ways that reduce emissions and these things work together. We have a more equitable and low carbon society. Great. Thanks for these answers. There's another question which is really interesting as well. Um, so someone asked, how do we make post growth politically feasible? How do we campaign for it? What words and images 
should be used to persuade and inform. So I think, yeah, this is a really um, important question as well. It's about um, creating narratives and, um, yeah, as Kate already explained, this idea of growth is so deeply ingrained in our think um, perceptions and, um, yeah, how do we transform these ideas into actions and make them more available for everyone so that they just don't just stay like in these kind of um, academic Western kind of ideas. Um, and this is what I work, this is the work I'm yeah, doing all okay. the time. So I, we, I don't talk about post -growth, about growth uh, as um, George Lakoff would say, you know, we, I, so I don't use the word growth or degrowth because I think we just keep framing it around growth. I want something else. I'm just, I want something else. I want a regenerative and distributive economy. So I focus on speaking what we're for. We're for living in the donut, meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. What's not to like? Let's become regenerative. Let's be distributive. These are the dynamics and we need to put in place the designs that bring this about. Our strategy at Donut Economics Action Lab is that we've never once ever asked or tried to persuade or, or convince anybody to use the donut or talk about the donut or engage with it. We only work with change makers who already want to do this. The power of that is that it's so much more compelling. Uh, for a mayor of a city who's thinking mm, no, don't, that that all sounds very radical the most compelling thing for that mayor is to see another mayor who's already doing it so we work with change makers who are just already on it uh, whether it's a city or a town whether it's a business whether it's a community whether it's a government and people are bringing it about and it's really hard because you're bringing about far more regenerative distributive patterns and ownership in a system that is divisive and degenerative. So you're fighting against those larger dynamics. It's never easy work, but you've got to make it visible. You've got to make it irresistible. You've got to make it compelling and clear for people to see. Um, and I don't know if it's gonna work, but this is the work I'm, I'm doing every day. This is what we're doing through Donut Economics Action Lab. It's one strategy. And there are others who need to bring down the old system and point out its hypocrisies and its exploitation and its corruption. That work matters too. There are other people who need to work very, very quietly for probably a decade to try and change the tax code and it'll probably never really be noticed and it'll make a huge difference. So there are many, many roles in this work, but the position we've taken is to work at the end of possibility to show and to make visible the possibilities. And actually it's so much more appealing to live in a neighborhood that is walkable, bikeable, family friendly, uh, doesn't have cars driving through it all the time, doesn't cut community off, to live in a place where jobs are local, where you're buying things from shops that are owned by people who live in the society that you're part of, where most kids go to the same school, that is a strong sense of community. So when you get it in action, it becomes irresistible in itself. I agree with Kate that we have to name it or tell it in a way that the people are interested in it. And I think it's interesting, Kate, you said earlier that um, people don't understand the, this idea of growth or non-endless growth or anything, because my experience is that this question or this idea of saying, hey, we live on a finite planet, you cannot endlessly grow, and our economy depends on that, speaks to the people a lot. And also speaks to them in personal terms, like we all know our time is not endless, and it's based on 24 hours a day, and it's like limited in, in time overall. And the people understand, well, if I always have more products and more services and more information that get up, I have to deal with, then I'm overwhelmed. So first of all, I think there's things behind it we can talk about. And then I want to share two experiences. So with the Laboratory for New Economic Ideas, so the place I worked in or I found it and I will work in again, most probably, but I'm not working in ad right now because I'm running this campaign. We've um, worked on the vision behind it. And last year we did a project called Future for All. Unfortunately, it's not translated into English yet, but we'll do that this year. We tried to find a vision of a society which is um, yeah, thriving <laughs> and which is interesting and attractive to people. And it's not only talking about our analysis and why it's bad, but it's throwing a vision of the future. And we uh, pointed a picture of 2048 because we thought, well, there's so many structures that have to change that we need a long time. And I guess that comes back to what Robert said in the beginning. We only have like eight or 10 or maybe 15 years to solve the climate crisis, but we have a lot more things to do afterwards. So that's a longer time vision. I think that's good to talk about the vision and to make it clear that um, we don't have the economic system right now that we will need in the future. And to be honest about that, because a lot of politicians, they try to pretend that we can keep going with a couple of reforms and it will all be somehow solved, but that's not the case. And as I, as I just mentioned, 
I'm running for parliament on a post-growth ticket this year, trying to bring that into the parliamentary space or at least into the um, election campaign space for now. And here, I think it's important to talk to, <laughs> yeah, thanks for liking that, and to, to the audience. Here, I think it's important to talk about things that connect to the people, right? So if it's about um, debt and housing, it's good to mention that and not to mention, but to engage with that. And if it's about climate justice, then to get with that. So in this degrowth space, there's a lot of things to connect with, the, connect with the people. And I call it social ecological reconstruction, more or less, or social ecological umbau, in order to connect to the people. And I think it's very interesting because I have the impression that a lot of um, politicians don't dare to speak about that because it says, oh, it overwhelms the voters and it's too difficult. But what I just said earlier, the people are missing that and they understand that capitalism is coming to its end and that we haven't found a new system yet and like we are running into major problems or we are, have them and they are aggravating, that we need a new solution that we have to find together. And I think it's actually good to address that because I think people are also um, yeah, reluctant to go to vote or not very much interested in politics anymore because they know that the solutions are not the solutions proposed are not connecting to the problems that people have. And I think we need to do that more. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, mention a, a, some specific things. Um, so, so some of the studies that I've done over the past year were commissioned by an organization called Reimagine Appalachia. Uh, for those of you that don't know the US very well, Appalachia uh, is the most, is includes West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, parts of Ohio, parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, the point is it, uh, especially West Virginia, is the most coal dependent state in the United States. It's the poorest state in the United States. By far, it is the least efficient in its use of energy in any state in the United States. And 70% of the people voted for Donald Trump in 2020. So uh, myself and my co-workers did a study that came out a few months ago, uh, commissioned by Reimagine Appalachia for West Virginia. And, um, you know, it, it was the, essentially the Green New Deal for, for West Virginia. Um, and what we were able to show, speaking about meeting people where they are, uh, as Nina mentioned, we were able to show, uh, you know, a real program through which um, the job creation would uh, vastly outweigh the job losses uh, through phasing out even coal in West Virginia. We were able to get the uh, endorsements of the mainstream labor movement. Uh, we were able, I, I don't know how much you follow US politics, but this one senator from West Virginia is like the 50th vote for the Democrats. His name is Manchin. Uh, he has control over everything because he's the 50th vote. We were able to get his staff to actually uh, at least be reasonably supportive of this Green New Deal for West Virginia. So I, I think it's really critical um, if we're talking about really engaging with people and really uh, making some headway politically to really truly meet people where they are. And where are they, where are they in, in West Virginia? 70% of them voted for Trump. Uh, and it's a coal dependent state. So if you're going to say we're phasing out coal, here's the option. Here's the alternative. Here's how we finance. Here's how we get from A to B. To me, that's a critical thing that we who have some economics uh, can engage in that and, and do something fairly useful. Thanks for that. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, we'll just uh, ask questions ourselves. Um, so we have one question um, asking how do we move from low value added activities to high value added activities in low income countries um, with kind of the rich countries consent and I think we can also tie this into um, how how do your ideas specifically address the global south and ensure that um, the countries that have contributed more to this climate crisis uh, are the ones bearing, bearing the brunt of the costs. Uh, well, just briefly myself, I mean, when, when I talk of the Green New Deal, it is a global Green New Deal. Uh, so it applies to all countries. All countries have to get to zero emissions. I mean, I've done a study, for example, in Puerto Rico, 
How, how does Puerto Rico get to zero emissions? Who pays for it? As I mentioned, you know, the countries that are responsible for causing the climate crisis need to pay for it. Maybe not 100%, but they need to pay for the vast majority of it so that the financing model that I developed, for example, in the book with Chomsky um, is relying on entire, almost entirely on financing from uh, the uh, rich countries transferring to the low income countries. I saw in the chat, somebody raised the point where I, I had said that it, we would get 150 million jobs. Um, just to clarify on that point, because the uh, person writing in said, well, multiply that by 30, you know, you've got half the world's population. That's not exactly the, mo the framework is you invest four and a half uh, trillion dollars a year, you will create uh, four point, uh, you'll create 150 million jobs or thereabouts. And that 150 million increment will continue over time. It's not cumulative. You don't get 150 in year one, and then it becomes 300 million in year two, 450 in three years. It's 150 on average throughout uh, the full uh, investment period. So, um, uh, you know, I again, I would just say that we have a, a realistic model, and it is it is actually most beneficial in the global south. Among other things, uh, it is, if we talk as economists, it is an import substitution model. If you go to uh, developing economies that don't have oil, the biggest thing that you have to talk about in terms of any macroeconomics of any kind whatsoever, what's the price of oil? How much are we going to import? How do we get the money to import oil? Well, if you can build a clean energy system domestically, you don't have to worry about that. That loosens up your options in terms of macro policy. And in addition, what you can do is introduce uh, clean energy uh, systems in rural areas that have basically zero electricity now. They've been promised this by politicians for generations, uh, but distributed energy systems based on solar and wind uh, are feasible. so kind to each other yeah so i agree a lot of things that robert said i think if we talk about the world distribution of work we have to have to take a look at its state now and i mean probably most of you know and as in any case the person who asked that but for now the problem is that there's a many many countries who say that they're the developing countries and they're developing towards an industrial path but the way the industrial distribution of work around the globe works is not that every country can be industrialized because there is some countries who have to deliver the resources. If they use it all themselves, then we wouldn't have, have all the resources to produce, produce cars, for example, in industrialized countries. So that means if we shape the world order of um, work, that means that there's a lot of less resources for the industrialized countries. And um, that means that we have to try to find a way to have this development in this way we stay we thrive within a donut maybe put it like that that doesn't depend that much on resource development and it takes a different path that's something the decolonizing movement or post-colonial movement has put forward for a long time right saying we need different visions of development that cannot all follow an industrial path and in that sense and um, if we talk about that system I think it would also watch out of um, the way we look at the decision making now. So if we talk about growth, for example, we often have the example that, oh, yeah, um, in China, in India, we have a, um, a, sorry, a rise in the middle class and people now also want cars or people also want to have a, a better life in the sense of um, material welfare. But that always get, goes on the on the costs of other people. So, for example, in, in China or India, we have very many special economic zones where um, land that was formerly common land is then used to put, put set up a factory and people are promised jobs. There's very few jobs, but they lose the country and they lose the uh, possibility of generating income by using the land. And a lot of people then use their own way of living and they make the way of making a living. There's not 
much development for them in there, but it's industrialization and they produce things in their own country. That's the way it has gone in all the industrialized countries before, as we have found as well, right? At the beginning of capitalism in the UK, it was the same thing. So if you talk about the development and redistribution on a global chain, on a global scale, we have to look out for the needs and the ways of um, development in south countries in the global south. And I, as for the as for the measures to take from the stance of an industrialized country, it's uh, first of all not pushing or subsidizing subsidizing own companies anymore to um, go into markets of other countries and to plunder resources there. Um, and in Europe, this can be the example of fish trawlers cr crossing seas everywhere in the world, or the, our subsidized agriculture, which then throws tomatoes on local markets in West Africa, or it can be anything where we take out resources on a, on a, on a big scale, but much too little paid. Um, and in that sense, that's a hard question on if that's more something that has to be pushed in the industrialized countries or in in the kind of the global south you know are they able in global power structures to throw out multinationals who plunder the resources and i think we have to um ally our battles in there sorry it's getting late <laughs> i'll keep it there i'll just jump in um with a uh, i'll go sideways because what would it mean to put the ideas of donor economics into practice in places and countries and cities in the global south? We've been downscaling the donut to cities and places of the global north and working with cities like Amsterdam and uh, Brussels and Copenhagen that wanted to do this and then have been approached by many cities and nations from the global south, let's call it, uh, that are saying we want to do this where we are and so we're adapting the methodology so we are we've been working with partner organizations in curacao and barbados in zambia in bangladesh india um in costa rica in brazil and we've been transforming the methodology that we used to these contexts in fact if anybody's really really interested we'll be running webinars open webinars tomorrow and thursday if you go to the donut economics action lab website You'll see we're running webinars in inviting people to hear how our partners worldwide are using these ideas. It doesn't solve everything. It doesn't have the answers, but what it has is a framework that gives them a holistic framework for thinking through with their knowledge, experience and, and national networks of innovation. How are we going to do this in our own country context? So I'm learning from the way they see to put these ideas into practice. Great, yeah, it's already 5.24, maybe uh, one last question, um, yeah, there's so many left, and but um, the one right now is um, about when will we reach a point of having enough stuff and what does that look like, which maybe is a good way of ending as well, and also, yeah, about measuring and, um, yeah, another person asked about um, alternatives to GDP, how do we measure um, yeah, the, the well-being and the thriving. What about the um, HDI, Human Development Index? Maybe some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, who wants to start? Nina? To go first. So I think it's very hard to answer who is the we. The, when do we reach the point where we have enough stuff? Because most probably many people who listen here have reached that level. A long time ago and societies um industrialized societies have reached that point where they're where they're out but they crossed the ecological line um in the 60s or 70s so we have had enough stuff the question is just is it the right stuff does it is the stuff that makes us happy and is it equally distributed so i think it's hard to answer that in a generalized way and obviously there is a paradigm in our society of having more stuff right so even in, in industrialized countries, even the poorest often have too much stuff in the sense of like they have a lot of things around them. It's just not enough to have a good life in a society which is based um, on paying a lot for your essential services. So maybe that's not still not enough money for what you need in your life. And also about comparing to everyone else and how much how much they had. About the GDP, I'm curious what Robert and Kate say on that. I think there's a lot of indicators who have been developed 
who are better than the GDP, for, for example, take in ecological costs or social costs. So if you have an accident that the GDP grows, but other indicators then don't grow. Um, in Germany, there is the National Wohlfahrts Index, the National Welfare Index. It has been developed, but not used that much. And I think that's part of the problem. Right? The J GDP is so powerful because it's something that is run across every nation. It's very easy, um, and, and easy, understandable, and easily comparable. And it will probably take some time until we establish something as strong as the GDP. Great. Kate, some final thoughts on this? Okay, um, so when I was in the late 1990s, I worked on the Human Development Index. I had a job at the Human Development Report Office in New York with UNDP for four years. Uh, it was a brilliant training uh, for me. And every year it was my job to go on the talk show radio for one of the countries that had just come at the top of the Human Development Index. So the Human Development Index contains three things. It's a brilliant idea created by Amartya Sen and Mabubu Haq. The aim was to say, let's measure not uh, the growth of nations, let's measure the well, well-being of their people. So let's measure health, education, and income per person as a proxy. And so at the top of that index, always, it was Canada or Australia or Norway. And so every year I had to go on their talk show radio and say, congratulations, Canada, you are calm top of the human development index. And I always did it through gritted teeth. Because I know that, well, well done, Canada or Norway, Australia, you are degrading the planet the way you live. You are running down Earth's life support systems and you're undermining the health and the education and the income opportunities of so many people on the other side of the world. And this isn't showing up at all in the Human Development Index. So it was a brilliant training ground for me. And at the time we didn't have the ecological metrics or we said we didn't know how to combine them. And I think many, many years later, I, it, it's partly what induced me to come back and draw the donut and say, let's measure this through the donut and let's create national donuts where we see both. Norway has a beautiful center of the donut. Norway is doing really well, but Norway has a massive red overshoot around the donut. And I love showing it to Norwegians and Canadians and Australians and Brits and Europeans and Americans because people's jaw hits the floor. Oh my God, is that us? We thought we were so good. We were Nordic, we're Nordic, we're so good. No, the Nordics are massively overshooting planetary boundaries. And until we see this story, we won't get that we need to deeply transform. So we need to move beyond the indicators. And by the way, the donut in 10 years time, we'll look back and say, look how crude this was. Ha ha, in 2021, they were using this. We will have better metrics and we will do this so much better, but we won't get there unless we start here. Any final thoughts, Bob? Uh, well, first, thanks again. This is a great, really stimulating discussion. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to Kate and Nina. Uh, I would just say, first of all, with respect to GDP, there's no debate, at least with me, uh, GDP is uh, terrible as an indicator of many, many things that are critical. Uh, we all know that GDP does not measure the distribution of income, so anything to do about differences doesn't measure class differences, it doesn't measure poverty, uh, it doesn't measure, measure gender or racial discrimination, so it, it sucks uh, for all of those things. It has some decent features um, and it's out there. Uh, it, the Human Development Index is a, a, an improvement in many ways. I think Kate made some good points, I don't need to, to re reiterate. Um, it does not also address ecology, neither does GDP, quite the contrary with GDP, if you uh, do bad things and you uh, create pollution, that can raise GDP and we don't subtract at all. So clearly we need much better indicators. And uh, this is a process that has to take place. Um, that said, there are, we can measure things. We, we don't need to just have one single metric called GDP or Human Development Index. We can measure things. We can measure things like poverty. We can measure pollution. We can measure emissions. And so if we don't like GDP or other aggregate measures, let's use the things we have. We have pretty decent measures of, for example, CO2 emissions, and we know we have to get them to zero. So rather than focus on how bad GDP is, let's say this is what we know about emissions. We're at 34 billion tons today. We have to be at zero in 28 and a half years. 
Um, how about on the question of when do we know how many people, uh, when we have too much stuff, and I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate Nina here a little bit. Um, I don't think most people have too much stuff. I, maybe I have too much stuff. That's fair. Uh, but I don't, when, when, I, when we think about a simple example like uh, people, 50% uh, of the rural population in developing countries don't have any elect access to electricity, they don't have too much stuff. They have too little stuff. It is transformative to their lives to be able to have access to electricity and running water. It saves lots of time in their lives that they can then do other things with. So I think we have to be very careful, uh, as Nina said, when we refer to this overall general we. Even in developed, rich countries, the US, like I said, West Virginia, rich country, very poor state. Most of the people are poor. They're dependent on coal. So let's think about people like that when we make these broad generalizations and focus on ways to trans to make their lives uh, better, easier, more uh, ecologically sane, and uh, think in terms of those specifics as opposed to having to rely on very, very broad generalities. Thanks again. Okay, thanks for that. So we'll have to wrap up there. So. Uh... I'd like to thank all the panelists again, Bob, Nina, and Kate. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. I hope that everyone attending learned uh, something about a new paradigm to think about how uh, economics can address the climate crisis. Um, as we mentioned in the chat, if you'd like to watch this panel later on, it'll be on the Rethinking Economics YouTube channel. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about economics and climate change, and specifically on this uh, alternatives to GDP front, uh, we have uh, more panels on Thursday that will address this question. All right, that's all we have today. Take care, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And let's keep the conversation going.